evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Please stand as we invite Father Masin Rume to ask God blessings on this evening's lecture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, gracious and merciful Father, we humbly come before you today as we inaugurate the ninth annual Carol Bristow Distinguished Lecture Series. Bless this event with your wisdom, Lord, that the speaker may articulate profound insights and the audience may receive these words with open hearts. May the discussions foster understanding, unity, and collective commitment to the advancement of Grenada, Cariaco, and PD Martinique. Guide us, O Lord, in our big push for transformation. Grant us the strength to embrace change with courage and resilience, recognizing that through your grace, we can overcome challenges and emerge stronger. Bless the efforts of all those involved in shaping Grenada's destiny, inspiring them to work tirelessly for the common good. As we engage in this dialogue, may your spirit of love and compassion permeate every word spoken and every heart present. May the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series be a source of inspiration, enlightenment, and empowerment for our nation. We do pray through Christ our Lord, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please continue, remain standing for the national anthem. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Father Marcy. You may be seated. Honorable Deacon Mitchell, who will be joining us very shortly, Prime Minister of Grenada, Ministers of Government, Mr. Adrian Thomas, welcome. Dr. Francis Severin, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies Global Campus, Grenada. Governor Timothy Antoine, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and feature speaker. Mr. Will Vaughan Granger, Chief Experience Officer, Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited. Permanent Secretaries, other senior government officials, Ambassador Bristol and the Bristol family. 
colleagues and students from the UWI community, St. George's University, the TA Marichal Community College, and UWI alumni, members of the media, specially invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening again, and I'm happy to see you here this evening. My name is Keisha Cummins Young Branch, your chair for this evening's lecture, and I welcome you to the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. I welcome you to the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. Our theme for this year's lecture is Grenada Coming of Age, or Big Push for Transformation. Permit me to introduce Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, the Deputy Director Acting of the University of the West Indies Global Campus to make the welcoming remarks. Minister of Government, welcome. To our Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Dr. Francis Severin, Governor Timothy Antwine, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, and our feature speaker, Mr. Will Vaughan Granger, Chief Experience Officer, Grenada Cooperative Bank, Archdeacon Michael Marshall and Mrs. Marshall, Father Marcin Rumick, Ambassador Bristol. Mr. James Bristol, and all members of the Bristol family. Colleagues, friends, well-wishers of the UWI community and St. George's University and the T.A. Marishal Community College. Ladies and gentlemen, warm good evening. The University of the West Indies Global Campus Grenada warmly welcomes you to this, our ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. We are very pleased to continue this series as a part of our mandate for public advocacy and engaging the community. We are indeed very proud of our UWI. Last year, we celebrated 75 years of stalwart service to the Caribbean community. We continue to hold the coveted place of being ranked in the top 4% of the best universities in the world, according to Times Higher Education Rankings. <laughs> At Global Campus Grenada, we are now serving 342 online students, including 18 from the sister island of Karakou. Our students are currently completing bachelor's degrees master's degrees, and the doctorate in education, or the EDD. We proudly boast of our first doctorate in education recipient from the sister island of Karakou. We also offer professional development courses each semester. We are currently serving 190 such students from the public and the private sector. Within the last academic year, we have partnered with the Ministry of Social Development in offering courses in gender development. In this, the 50th year of our independence, we are very happy to partner with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and, of course, Grenada Cooperative Bank to welcome our son of the soil, Governor Timothy Antwine, as this year's feature speaker. Grenada Cooperative Bank has been with us from the inception of these lecture series, and we wish to sincerely thank them for their excellent service to the Grenadian community. We are once again happy to continue this lecture in the name of Mr. Carol Bristol, QC, former chair of the UWI Territorial Advisory Committee and former tutor at the UWI. Thank you, Ambassador Gillian Bristol, Mr. James Bristol, 
and Mrs. Ruth Bristol and all the rest of the Bristol family for always accepting our invitation to come physically and, of course, online. This year, we are hosting a little fundraiser. So if you cast your eyes this way, we have a beautiful painting by our artist, Suzanne Maines, and we are raising funds, a uh, bursary for our students. It's only 50 easy per chance, but we'll take US as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it indeed gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you for coming and enjoy this evening's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philip Dow. The Grenada Cooperative Bank, Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited has been a major sponsor for this lecture since its inception. Please join me in welcoming the Chief Experience Officer of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, Mr. Will Vaughn Granger, to make some brief remarks. Minister of Government, Dr. Francis Severin, Pro-Vice-Chancellor and Principal, University of the West Indies Global Campus, Governor Timothy Antoine, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and Feature Speaker, Permanent Secretaries, Senior Government Officials, Ambassador Gillian Bristol, James Bristol, Ruth Bristol and other members of the Bristol family. Students of the wider UE community, St. George's University and TA Marishow Community College, members of the media, other specially invited guests. Good evening. Permit me to start by saying that it is with immense pride that I stand here to deliver remarks at this very special event. On behalf of the Board of Directors, management and staff of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, I wish to extend congratulations to the University of the West Indies Global Campus for hosting this year's Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. The bank is elated to once again be associated with this event. From its inception in 1932, Core Bank and the Grenadian people have forged an unbreakable bond. Being the only indigenous bank on the island, Coa Bank has been an integral part of the development of this country and our people over the last 92 years. We always aspire to bring financial, cultural, historical, and intellectual awareness to our communities. We believe in the power of knowledge and the importance of fostering meaningful discussions in the development of our nation. Rest assured, that we'll re we will remain resolute in our commitment to the holistic development of our country. I must say, the theme chosen for this year's lecture, Grenada's coming of age, our big push to transformation, is timely and fascinating as we celebrate our 50th anniversary as an independent nation. We are confident that Governor Timothy Antoine, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, our featured presenter and a proud son of the soil will educate us on this topic. And at the end, we'll all have a greater appreciation for resilience, ingenuity, and fortitude of a nation that has defied the odds and illuminated its fingerprints on the world stage. We invite everyone to enjoy this evening's lecture and discussions, which promises to be stimulating and edifying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Granger. We do appreciate all of your support throughout the years. I know you are here to see the governor, but just bear with me for a bit. Um, we'll take a little break with a little pan. And at the end of it, I want you to tell me 
what song she's playing. Okay. Thank you, Rene. Thank you. 
Thank you. Was that a good challenge? Did you guess the song? No? I'm not, I'm not even going to help you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rene. You did wonderfully. <laughs> I now call on Dr. Philip Dow to introduce our featured speaker. Timothy N.J. Antoine is an economist and development practitioner he has served as the third governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank from the 1st of February 2016. Mr. Antoine holds a BSc in Economics from the University of the West Indies Cable Campus and an MSc in Social Policy and Planning in Development Countries from London School of Economics. He has invested 14 years of his life as Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Government of Grenada, from 2005 to 2007, he served as advisor to the executive director for Canada, Ireland, and the Caribbean, and was based in Washington, DC. In 2016, he was the recipient of the Order of Grenada Gold Award for Excellence. In 2018, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in human letters by St. George's University. Also in 2018, he received a Certificate of Outstanding Leadership and Public Service from the UWI Cave Hill on the occasion of UE's 70th anniversary. Mr. Antoine is currently Chairman of the Eastern Caribbean Home Management Mortgage Bank, sorry, and Chairman of the Eastern Caribbean Securities Exchange. But most importantly, he's a beloved son of the soil Welcome home, Governor Antoine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip Dow. Grenadian family, good evening. So good to see all of you. I do want to stand on the protocol already established. Save and accept to recognize Honorable Adrian Thomas, Minister for Tourism, the Creative Economy, and everything else. Uh, thank you. I also want to recognize the Bristol family uh, who is here this evening and in the room and those who are joining online. I want to recognize, of course, Mr. Granger from the Grenada Cooperative Bank, sponsor, but my fellow Grenadians, everyone, especially happy to the students who are joining, many of which I am told are online. And as I look around the room, I see family. I see blood family, I see my siblings, I see ECCB family, I see colleagues, I see church family, and I see my Grenadian family, brothers and sisters. So it's great to be home, great to have this opportunity to share with you. So, as a proud Grenadian and alumnus of the University of the West Indies, I am honored to have been invited by the UWI Global Campus Grenada to deliver the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture. It is a privilege to honor the memory of the illustrious Carol Bristol QC who served his community, his country, and our region with distinction. I recall from our limited encounters his intellect and dry wit. I also recall his cricket commentary. Anyone remembers? And he especially made me laugh with the matter of fact way in which he announced when a batsman was clean bowled. If you remember the commentary, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, I've had the distinct privilege of working with his son, James Bristol Casey former Attorney General, his daughter, Gillian Bristol, former Ambassador to the United States and current Chair of the Grenada Integrity Commission. And I just met his grandson, Dominic, 
So I'm very pleased to see all of the family members this evening. I want to thank Dr. Philip Dow, Head of Site Grenada, Deputy Director, UWI Global Campus, and Mrs. Keisha Comisong Branch, Program Officer, for the invitation and for the arrangements for this lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for hardworking organizers, including, including the team there, including the team there. Yes. I also want to express my appreciation and acknowledge the assistance of my colleague, uh, Dr. Emma Fosuado at ECCB, who coordinated my participation and supported the preparation, my preparation for this lecture. So, our topic this evening, as you can see, Grenada's coming of age, our big push for transformation. That topic leverages the milestone moment in which we find ourselves with Grenada at 50. It also speaks to a challenge I posed when the ECCB celebrated launch of celebrations of our 40th anniversary last year, the so-called big push challenge. And thirdly, it speaks to the current thrust of the government of Grenada for transformation. So that's where the topic came from. For those of you who do not recall, the big push challenge is framed as a question. Here's the question. Okay, clicker, I need you to move. So I need some technical assistance to get this clicker to move. The question is, what will it take to double the size of our economy over the next 10 years? What will it take to double the size of our economy over the next 10 years? Excuse me, still not moving. Okay, there we are. All right, patience is a virtue. Yes, that's the lesson number one. All right. So here's the question. And immediately what you should see here is that the big push requires us to move the Grenadian economy from 3.6 billion, which is where we are at this moment, to 7.2 billion. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. And by the way, if you want to personalize this, then you ask yourself the question, what will it take to double your network? And you could fill in how many years you want to do that. That's the challenge. Let's keep that in mind. We're going to circle back on this as we go through this, this talk this evening. Keep that in mind. And the ECCB's own mantra as we implement our strategic plan for our region is transforming the ECCU through innovation and collective action. So, before I jump into the talk, <laughs> I want to issue three disclaimers. Disclaimer number one, this lecture is not an alternative vision for Grenada. <laughs> Grenada has a national strategic development plan. How many of you read this plan? Put up your hand. Oh boy. Well, it's almost as like if you don't have a plan if you haven't read the plan. <laughs> Homework assignment number one. Go home and read the plan. It's 175 pages. It's an important plan. More importantly, the Prime Minister on February 5th of this year, when he shared his Vision 75, made it abundantly clear that he is embracing the plan and we are going to implement this plan. So we need to own the plan. I see some people in the room who worked on the plan, and before I went to the ECCB, I actually had a contribution in the early days of that plan. So the Prime Minister eloquently cast the vision for the bridge between Golden Jubilee, 50 years, and Diamond Jubilee, 75 years. So that's a 25-year bridge. And it is now for us to come around that vision and make it a reality. My second disclaimer is that this lecture will not cover all of the requisites of our big push for transformation. But I propose to identify some critical enablers and drivers for transformation, for the big push. And not just to identify them, but to urge your attention and action. And I want to be very clear this, uh, this evening. The mission on which we are embarked is urgent. 
is urgent. I'm going to share a lot of information with you tonight. I'm going to challenge you this evening. But frankly spoken, we have to act. And that's the bottom line. We have to do the resolve to act, to take collective action, if we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. And my third disclaimer is this. I will not join the debate sparked by scholar, Grenada's 10-time Calypso monarch, and our reigning, reigning independence monarch, <laughs> on whether at 50, Grenada is still young and not yet in her prime. Suffice it to say, P.S. Scholar, in the year of our golden jubilee, we have a prime opportunity to reflect, to reset, to recommit, and to accelerate the pace of transformation. So with these three disclaimers in mind, where do we want Grenada to go? Up or down? Where do we want Grenada to go? Up or down? Where do we want Grenada to go? Up or down? All right, you're warming up now. So let me tell you this before we continue. If during this lecture, because we're taking a plane right for the next hour or so, any, your neighbor falls asleep. <laughs> Here are your instructions. You have to listen very carefully to the instructions. I know you had a long day, but you have to, say, you have to pay attention now. You must nudge your neighbor and say, neighbor, up. <laughs> neighbor, up. No, you can practice it if you want. No, one more thing. No, no violence, no violence. It's a nudge. But I'm going somewhere with this. You see, on this journey of big push, on this journey of transformation, some of us are going to fall asleep. Some of us are going to get tired. Some of us may get discouraged. Some of us may get, may get disillusioned. And we have to help each other along the way. And the way we will do that is with a nudge and an encouragement. Oh. You got it? All right. If I see anybody sleeping, I'll come in and do it myself. <laughs> All right, are we good to go now? Because I'm going to start to move with some speed. So here are our three key messages. Every talk I do, I like to leave a few key messages. In a sense, if you remember nothing else from the talk, here are the key messages. We have three. Let's go. Key message number one. Transformation demands a critical mix of mindset, skill set, policy set, accompanied by essential investments. That's the first message. By the way, if you see anything on the slides, just pick up your, your one that captures the imagination you want to remember, you can take a snap with your phone. We will make the presentation available. I also will have a text that will be available. But as we go along, if there's anything that you want to pick, or maybe you have a question, so you want to remember, you can put up your phone and take, take it. That's, that's fine. Second key message is this. Transformation necessitates bold and courageous leadership and an unprecedented coming together of Grenadians, home and abroad, to take collective action. And my third and final message is this. Transformation requires a relentless pursuit of resilience. And you're going to see why in a little while. You're going to see why I make that point in a little while. Where do we want Grenada to go? All right. So now according to the IMF, Outlook April 2020, 2000 rather, the size of Grenada's economy, watch this, watch this, the size of the Grenada economy in 1974 was $80 million, eight zero. The average income, what we call per capita income in economics, was $800. And the population of Grenada at that time was 98,000. Fast forward now to 2023, what do we find? The economy is now 3.6 billion, 43 times more than it was in 1974. The average income has increased from $800 to $30,000, 38 times more than it was in 1974. But the population has only moved to 115,000, 
17% more than it was in 1974. Now, you've got to stay with me. I'm going somewhere with all of this. I'm setting the table. I'm setting the table. So how did Grenada fare over time? Well, that's a hard debate. In my own humble assessment, we did reasonably well. But I do feel we could and should have done even better. And I'll show you why as we go along. As we go along. So the challenge before us this evening is to double the Guinean economy from 3.6 billion to 7.2 billion. That means we have to grow this economy of about 7% per year for the next 10 years. About 7% per year for the next 10 years. That's the challenge. Now, let me be honest, and let me be clear before I continue. When we speak about doubling the economy, the big push, we are really talking about a bigger pie, a bigger pie, where Grenadians can realize their God-given potential, where opportunities abound, where the unemployed, the underemployed, the disengaged, the frustrated, the bright can find expression in the Grenadian economy. And that all boats can rise in a rising tide. So this is not simply about economics. We use, I use that particular challenge to find a way to capture a conversation and to focus us on how we move forward. And to use some economic tools to assist the conversation. Building a country is never solely about economics. And it is never solely about GDP. So let me be very clear about that. Per capita income has its limitations. But it is a useful tool for which to build this conversation. And let's be honest. We cannot build anything. We cannot subtract if there's no addition and multiplication. If you don't grow this pie, then we can't do the things we want to do, for example, in the creative arts. That beautiful rendition of up from here that we heard earlier on. And the creative that we've seen on display during this celebration of our Golden Jubilee. We have to give them more space to function and to express themselves. That requires, requires a growing economic pie. So I want to be very clear. This doubling of GDP is not simply about economics and about moving from A to B. It's about the opportunity, the enlargement of possibilities for Grenadians, home and abroad, to be able to make their contribution to the homeland and to grow this economy and present a future for our children and grandchildren of which we can be proud. Is this challenge of growing the economy, doubling over the next 10 years at a clip of 7% per annum, difficult? Yes. Impossible? No. If you look in the 1970s, we actually did it. We actually did it in the 1970s and early 80s at various times. And then we saw a slowdown as we entered the 90s, and a lot of that had to do with the secular decline of growth and some global forces and shocks, which you will see. So if you look on screen, what do we observe? 1978 to 2022, the growth performance of Grenada. The red line is the target we typically try to, to push, which is 5%. For this discussion of big push, for Grenada, it means 7%. But normally at ECCB, we encourage countries to target 5%. So the red line you see across is 5%. By the way, you see the Grenadian colors. The green... Is ECCU, yes, we thought about that. The green is ECCU. So you see what's happening at the regional level. And the goal is Grenada. Got that? What are you observing? Up and down. Up and down. What I call a seesaw syndrome. A seesaw syndrome. And if you notice in those epochs, those periods, you see 1980, 1989. We had preferential treat, uh, access from EU for bananas. We were growing at 6, six and a 1% for the ECCU. Grenada was growing at 4%. Then you see it started to come down as the access started to move away, and we, that was stripped. And then you see in the period 2000 to 2009, Grenada grew at only 2.5%. What went on in that period? We had 9-11, external economic shock. Then we had Hurricane Ivan. And of course, I don't have it there, but we had Hurricane Emily right after that, eight months later. Yes? 
And then, right at the end of the century, uh, well, the turn, the next, next, next uh, 10 years later, the global financial crisis. Notice that. And you see the... And every time we have a shock, the economy goes into contraction. It's like it's going into a valley. Down. You see the... Dump? And then we have to walk our way back up to get back to where we were. Fast forward now, and you got COVID. You see what happened? Grenada's economy contracted by around 14, 15% in 2020 as a consequence of the pandemic. And then we've been working our way back to where we were pre-COVID. And we just about back to where we were pre-pandemic. The point I'm making by showing you this is that if we're going to have that big push, if we're going to sustain, if we're going to be able to double the size of our economy and opportunity, we have to minimize these shocks and the impact of these shocks. And the way you do that is by building resilience. That's the point I made in the third key message. We have to commit to a lifelong pursuit of building resilience because it is that that will minimize the impact of those shocks. What is resilience? I define resilience as the capacity to absorb and withstand shocks and to bounce forward, not back, forward after a shock. Every crisis or shock must be leveraged to put the country in a better position than it was. So for example, with the pandemic, for all of our difficulties, our health system, some of you may not agree with me because health is a very sensitive issue, but our health system is presumably a little better off because we have a little more equipment at the hospital. We have a little more consciousness about um, primary health. We have a little more consciousness about vaccines and a range of things. You may or may not disagree with me on this. After Ivan, we built back better. We built, we did, we did. We built back better. That's a legacy, a positive legacy out of a difficult situation. But what you want to do to sustain that trajectory of development is to minimize the boom and the bust, the yo-yo syndrome, the seesaw syndrome that you see on screen. That's part of the challenge that we have to manage. So now, let's get to the pit and substance of this talk. It is time for Grenada to soar. It is time for Grenada to go. To go. All right, remember your assignment. Look around, see if anybody's falling asleep. You have my permission to nudge them up. So, as we take flight, because we're going up, we have to understand atmospheric conditions. You following me? Because there are global forces impacting Grenada and the currency union. In an opinion piece published in the Financial Times on the 16th of January 2024, Martin Wolf, the chief economist, economics commentator at Financial Times, articulated five major forces shaping the global economic landscape. Check them out. Check this out. Yeah, they are. Demographic changes, climate change, technological innovation, the global diffusion of knowledge, and growth. Five global forces. How are these forces impacting Grenada? What are the implications for Grenada? Let me quickly take you, the, take you through these uh, forces. So let's start with demographics. Grenada, like the developed world, is aging, albeit at a slower pace. That's the population pyramid you see there. Check this out. According to the UN World Population Prospects 2022, the median age in Grenada nearly doubled to 30.8 years, let's say 31 years, in 2021. What does the median age mean? The median age means that 31. What does 31, the median age of 31 mean? It means half the population under 31 and half above 31. All those who are under the age of 31, put up your hands right now. Okay, all right, don't do that. We will leave that. All right. You see, I don't want to commit to you because I saw some people raising their hand for 31. I mean, 
We're doubling, you know, we're not having, you know, I see some of us, um, anyhow, let's move on. And check this out, check this out. I'm going somewhere with this, but I have to set the table to, to get to where we're going. The fertility rate has dropped from 4.2 to 2. Well, I am evidence of that. I come from a family, everybody knows this, most of you know that. I come from a side of 15, one, five. My wife and I have two. My sister in the audience has one. No, not even two, one. I have two sisters. I have, well, I have several sisters in the audience. And none of them has more than one. And some have zero. No pressure, by the way, ladies. No pressure. No pressure. Take your time. Take your time. It's not laziness, as the Bajans would say. So we have had our own baby bust. Now, you know, you have to understand this, folks. Because the combination of migration, which you will see next, and the fact that our fertility rate has dropped explains why the population has only grown by 17, 17% over 50 years. And part of doubling this economy requires us to grow the population of Grenada. Business folks will tell you, hello? <laughs> Guys, my, my fellow Grenadians, this, this, this cannot, this cannot, <laughs> oh boy, I, I don't know what I walked into there, but we clearly have, we clearly have stirred up something there. But, but, but folks, let me be candid. We, we, we can't be, we can, this can be a, a difficult discussion. We cannot grow this economy if we don't grow the people in the economy. Now, I am not encouraging, I am not encouraging teenage pregnancy. I am not encouraging people to go out and simply make children without responsibility. But our economy does need skills, people with skills to grow the economy. You know, people talk about, let me show you the next slide, and then I'll come back to make the point, because I don't want to stick. Take a look at this. As of 2020, according to the UN Migration Report, there are 62,000 Grenadian migrants abroad. No, that, is, that does not say there are 62,000 Grenadians abroad. There are more. These are 62,000 who left Grenada and are abroad. So this is not children of Grenadians. This is not spouses of Grenadians. If you add those up, the number will be significantly larger. These are people who left Grenada. In a sense, if they did not leave Grenada, the population might be around 180,000. But of course, people migrate everywhere in the world. So we understand that. And what this tells you is that one in five, two in five are in the US, about 25,000. One in five, about 12,000 are in the United Kingdom, followed by Canada, and Trinidad and Tobago. So that's the, that's the numbers that you see on the screen. That's where most of our Grenadians are. Of course, Grenadians are all over the world. But that's where the bulk, the, 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 the critical clusters are, if you will, of Grenadians abroad. So, having said all of that, life expectancy in Grenada is now average around 75 years. Part of the reason why it is not higher, in Singapore it is 82 years, for example, is because if you look at the bottom of your screen, it's the non-communicable diseases, the chronics, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, cancers. What does this slide say? Four in five Grenadians are dying from the chronics. In fact, it is 83%, so we run that to four in five. 80% is four in five. Four in five Grenadians are dying from the chronics. When you put migration with a low fertility rate for two, plus the high incidence of NCDs, we begin to understand why the population has not grown significantly over the last 50 years. And part of doubling the economy requires us to grow the population. And therefore, we have to arrest the issues of the pull and the push migration. Well, there's more pull than push. Well, you could argue that. The out migration. The low fertility rates, well, that's a harder one to, dissolve, to resolve. And the 
high incidence of NCDs, chronics, and what that is doing to our households. People in their primes are dying from these chronics. All of us know. All of us know folks, family, classmates, who have died in their prime from the chronics. We lost some people in the COVID because of the chronics. We have to address this issue, folks. The Dublin, so I'm beginning to show you, this is not simply about economics. There are health issues involved, there are education, there are migration, a range of issues which we have to consider if we're going to make that big push. So I'm just setting it up for you. Let's move on. Don't want to stick too long. Natural disasters, climate change. According to an IMF study in 2018, the Caribbean is more likely, seven times more likely than anywhere else in the world to be hit by a natural disaster. Seven times more. And the losses from those disasters are six and a half times higher than the global average. IMF study, Bracing the Storm 2018. That tells you what we're dealing with with respect to the climate crisis that we're facing. Last year was the hottest year on record. We know that. So, technological innovation. So technology is abounding. And um, now we have AI, artificial intelligence. So I went to AI and I asked AI a question. AI, tell me, what do you see, where do you see Grenada in the next 25 years? This is what AI, chat GPT to be precise, had to say. Predicting the future is challenging. But one could hope for continued de development, stability, and prosperity in Grenada over the next 25 years with advancement in various sectors such as economy, technology, and education. However, it is essential to consider that unforeseen global events and local factors can influence the trajectory of any country. Well, I, I heard a statistic that say AI is right at least 50% of the time. What I will say about this, while this is not deeply insightful, it is useful. Because AI offers two things here. Hope and a word of caution. Check it out. <laughs> Let me move on. Global diffusion of knowledge. Martin Wolf, from where I drew this particular frame, makes the point that the ability of countries to successfully harness knowledge that is now widely available fuels and accelerates development. And he makes the examples of India and China in particular, where in some cases, they have not developed the technology, but they have harnessed the technology. If you go to India, for example, you're not going to see very many iPhones because it's too expensive for the average Indian. But they have taken the technology found a way to deliver it in a far cheaper um, modality to be able to make, for example, smartphones widely available to Indians to drive the payments revolution, to drive the digital uh, economy in India. So he's saying, a small country like Grenada, for example, we may not be developing some of the research, the R&D, but it is for us to harness and then use for our advantage. And then finally on growth, and finally on growth, Look at this. The global economy has slowed down. Over the last decade or two, you see a, a general secular decline in growth. The principal reason we believe is a decline in productivity. So if I take this home to Grenada, what are we looking at here? The economy grew, is estimated by 3.6% last year, 2023. The projection for 2024 is 4.2%. For 2025, early days yet, it's 3.7%. But where do we need to be if we're going to double the size of this economy? What's the, what's the magic number? 7%. 7 oh, you're paying attention. Give yourselves a round of applause. Very good. Very good. This is a class I could work with. Yes, man. So, the challenge for us, policymakers, and all of us involved with Grenada, and of course the Currency Union by extension, is to double the growth rate in Grenada. I'm focusing on Grenada tonight. That's the talk. The talk is focused on Grenada. Coming of age. It's another way of saying going up. 
Yes? The big push for transformation. 3.7% next, 4.2 this year, 3.7. We have to get that up to 7%. So that's the challenge we have. What do we need to do to get there? I'm going to get there shortly. Stay with me. So now, against this backdrop, we finish the atmospherics, the global forces. I now want to draw your attention to some key enablers for the big push. And I, I've created a very simple framework to guide us through that process. The people, the public finances, the plan, the process, the priorities, and the payoff. All peace. Yeah, I like to do a little word smitten now and then. Let's start with the people. Pay attention, folks. Stay with me on this. The first key enabler for going up is the right mindset. The right mindset. Such a mindset ought to be both God-honoring and growth-oriented. God-honoring and growth-oriented. The God-honoring mindset is not about religion. It's about our values. Are you with me? It's about our values. The scriptures declare, godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Those of you who prefer the King James Version, righteousness exalts. What is exalt? What is exalt? To go up. Yes? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I understand sometime last year the Prime Minister asked the nation a question. Who are we becoming? It's a very pertinent question. We could double the size of this economy. And if we're going up in crime and lawlessness, this is not going to work, folks. It is not going to work. Who are we becoming? Those of you who know me well know I'm not very religious, but I'm a strong man of faith. So this is not about religion. And some of you will say, in a talk like this, it is old-fashioned and out of place to talk about God honoring mindset. That's part of the problem we have. That is exactly why we are where we are. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. As a nation, we must cultivate values that respect human life, that respect people's views, political and religious differences, that respect women, that respect the environment, that embrace the dignity of work, and that promote patriotism and nation building. That is a God-honoring mindset. I just gave you the definition. That's my definition. Professor Carla Dweck of Stanford University has done extensive work on the growth mindset. And essentially, the growth mindset reframes problems as opportunities. And persons who possess that mindset are more resilient than those who have a fixed mindset. Again, I won't go into that in the interest of time. But we have to look no further than our Olympic and world champion, Kirani James, to understand what a growth mindset is. The first thing for us Grenadians in this big push for transformation is the right mindset. God-honoring, growth-oriented. Let me also add on growth mindset. Persons with a growth mindset should also take responsibility for nation building. And I would leverage the example of the Prime Minister on February 5th. That includes for our health. Anybody remember what he said? We could cost about the hospital all we want. And yes, we have to fix those issues in the hospital. But it starts with us and how we live our lives. Remember the basic test he did? Bend down and touch your toes? Okay, I won't ask anybody to do that this evening. I assure you I could do it, but I don't want to have any wardrobe mark function, so I would, I would leave that for now. And the second thing I want to add about this growth mindset Sorry, am I disturbing the painting? Is there energy in the room? All right, we need energy to, go this, to do this big push. We need energy. 
All right? And that's a lovely painting by Susan, by the way. The second thing I want to add is that persons with a growth mindset do not believe or expect the government to do everything. It is amazing to me. This is 31 years for me in public life, public service. Every conversation begins with what the government is doing or not doing, should do or not do. Folks, we got we to gotta break this trap. It cannot only about the government. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not letting government off the hook. Government has certain responsibilities. They have to deliver on certain things. They have mandates. They have to deliver. But the idea that government has to do everything and solve all problems in... Come on. Grenada at 50, we must know by now that is not reality. And that is not possible, it's not right, it is not proper. The government must do what the government must do, but the citizens also must play their part in nation building. And that's part of the growth mindset that we have to see. Let me move on. The public service. The public service. Oh, no, 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 I ain't get to finances yet. I don't get there shortly. Sorry, I, 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 I robbed you one, but we get into the public service next. The second key enabler is a modern and professional public service. I want to hail the hard-working women and men in the Grenada Public Service. Some of them are in this room right now. Some of them I know personally. Some of them I worked with for many, many years. I see some colleague PSs there. I, I greet them. I know they work hard. And it gives me no pleasure to say this, but I have to also call out the limers and the paid vacationers. I'm not asking you folks. I know what I'm talking about. Limers and paid vacationers. When I look around the region, it seems to me that many of our public services are broken. Because frankly spoken, the lament I hear in Grenada, I hear in many other countries in the currency union. If we take the case of Grenada, if we are brutally honest, the politicization of the public service started in the 1970s. You, you, you could check. I mean, I, I'm not going to argue that. I know that. But the point I make tonight is that the state of the public service stands as a binding constraint on Grenada's capacity to grow and to double the size of the economy. It is an effective lid on the country's potential. Public servants, hear me well. I'm a public servant. I'm not beating up anybody tonight. I've given credit to those who are working hard, some of whom I know, but I've also called out those who are not. In this enterprise of doubling the size of the economy, we all have to get in this fight, and we all have to work hard together. That's important. So we have to fix the public service. Three things I would recommend that we do right away, or as soon as it's practicable. One, a new law that brings the public service into the modern age. We are still operating with a 1969 law. 1969 law. This is a law that was handed to us by our colonial masters. And up 50 years after independence, we have not seen it fit to modernize the public service and change the law. Think about the number of laws we've passed in this country over the last 50 years. And we haven't gotten around to the Public Service Act. Yes, ponder that. I move on. An, an academy, an academy that continually trains public servants, including senior leaders, and provides proper orientation sessions for ministers of government. You know, the irony is that, oh Lord, this is taking far longer than I wanted, but. The irony, so you guys have to stay with me on this. The irony is that almost everybody is frustrated in the public service. The current public servants, the long-standing public servants, feel that other people have arrived. It used to be called, I don't know if it's still called 340. And these people who have come in, they don't know anything about the public service. They don't know the rules. And they come in and they're trying to push their weight around. But then the people who have just come with a mandate are frustrated with those who are there very long, who know the rules, and who seem to be obfuscating progress, and who seem to be holding up things. And if you talk to ministers of government, very honestly, they too have their frustrations. Everybody frustrated. 
Almost everybody. Maybe for a few exceptions. Folks, we got to fix this. We got to fix this. Finally, on this issue, an effective system of accountability for performance. An effective system of accountability for performance. New law, academy for training, continuous training, and accountability for performance. Now to the public finances. Whew, stayed very long on that one, but one of the legacies of the home loan program is a fiscal responsibility law that was passed in 2015, which codifies Grenada's commitment to fiscal discipline and enhances fiscal resilience. That framework has served Grenada very well. Think about the pandemic and the fact that Grenada, the government, had resources to help cushion the effect with safety nets. Or the fiscal fundamentals to draw resources from international sources to help during a difficult time. Tourism shut, revenue down, in some cases by 50% at one point. But more recently, the payment of pensions. That's because of the sacrifice you made, we made, and that framework called the Fiscal Responsibility Law. Grenada, whatever you do, preserve that law. It has served you well. It is serving you well. I know some of you didn't agree with some aspects of the law, but I think we all agree, those of us who have received pension will agree that it was worth it. Because you could have pronounced your paying pension and have no space to pay the pension. Contrast that with 20, 2008 to 2013, when there was no fiscal space, global financial crisis, then morphed into a great recession. You know why? Because the government did not have the capacity. I was in the Ministry of Finance then. The government did not have the capacity to employ or deploy what we would call counter cyclical fiscal policy. Big word to simply say, when things are down, you spend more. When things are up or good, you spend less. You save for the rainy day. To do that, you have to have the fiscal space. You have to have the headroom. So I would be in the Ministry of Finance, and I would hear people cussing government, cussing the Ministry of Finance, cussing me. Spend the money, spend the money. And I'm like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they say. <laughs> we are not so wicked that we'd be holding this money if we had it to spend. They don't know that we have maxed out on debts. They don't know that we have maxed out on overdraft. They don't know that, I mean, there was no fiscal space. So the idea of the fiscal responsibility legislation is to have the fiscal space in a shock to be able to spend, cushion the effect, and get out of it as quickly as possible. That's why you have to preserve that framework. That's the flexibility it gives you to run counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Absent that, you know what happened? Instead of spending more, we had to cut more. And all that did was prolong the difficulties prolong the contraction of the economy. But you could only spend an easier way out if you have the resources so to do. A lot of people didn't understand that, and I still suspect 10, 15 years later, some people still don't understand that. We got to understand that. My union brothers and sisters were about the, but they have come to understand the value of having fiscal responsibility law. The truth is that if we had had that 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier, you see that good performance that I showed you earlier? We would have done even better. That's an example of what I mean. Because we'd have been able to ride out those shocks far faster than we have been able to do or were able to do. Very important for building resilience. Let's move on. The plan. So we have a national plan. One of the things the Prime Minister said on the 5th of February was that he intends to enact the plan into law, to give it the force of law. I welcome that step. I welcome that step. Because the first takeaway of the 2008 Growth Commission led by Nobel Laureate Mike Spence is that countries that succeed deliver high growth over a sustained period. The first key lesson is that they stick to a long-term plan. That's why Dr. James Osborne James called on that at the, at the independent service. And I was very pleased when the Prime Minister said he is going to move forward with enacting it into law. 
that will be unprecedented, but will set the stage for us to begin to not just do a plan, but actually implement a plan. I now await the governance arrangements that will accompany that law, that will include the monitoring of the plan, the implementation, and the adjustments that are needed as a situation warrant or dictate. Then I go to the process. I'm speeding up. The process. In this process, it is not just a whole of government approach, it's a whole of society approach. What does that mean? You know, one of the finest moments in Grenada's modern history, in my opinion, was the period of the homegrown program. You know why? Because we came together to rescue the country. People with different political views, with different personalities, with different, came together to solve the fiscal situation for Grenada. Government and the social partners came together. And as I say that, if you, if you will f forgive me for a moment, I think of the Judy Williams of blessed memory, Madonna Hafford of blessed memory. I actually wrote down some of the names on my way here because it came to me and I, Gloria Payne Banfield, Sandra Ferguson, Ray Roberts, Andrew Lewis, Dr. Osbert James, Father Sean Doggett, Alvin Clowden, Pastor Alfred Hosford, Chris Dialli, Petrifer Lewis Smith, Petra Charles Joseph, Mike Sylvester, and Dr. Keith Mitchell, the former Prime Minister. These were, I may have missed a few, but these were the Committee of Social Partners, the members that came together once a month, put our heads together to work through these issues during that difficult, challenging, challenging time. I remember Andre Lewis and Sandra Fogel sitting down around a table in the Ministry of Finance with Mike, myself, and a couple of other colleagues working through the monitoring of the homegrown program. And you know, folks, during that time, regardless of the differences of views, political and otherwise, I knew in my heart that these were Grenadian patriots, every single one of them. I never doubted that. Even when we disagreed on policy issues, even when there were strong disagreement on political issues, and I heard them, I understood that they were Grenadian patriots. And we worked together. And I'm very proud of that team and that committee and how we worked with the Grenadian people to make the sacrifices to turn the situation around. And in calling the names tonight is a way for me to say thank you. I appreciate you and what you did for your country, our country. The priorities. So now, what are the theaters of transformation? Give me the global forces, I'll give me the enablers, I'm now going to the drivers. So the drivers is the almost last thing before I get to ECCB and then I conclude. Stay with me. But we got our stamina on this journey. Eh? You can't burn, you can't burn. I mean, this is, not, this, is not a, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. So you have to stay with me. You have to stay with me. We're going to get some questions in a while. So I want to call these the theaters of transformation. The theaters of transformation. Let's move it along. We covered this already. Here we are. What are the drivers for doubling the size of the Grenadian economy over the next 10 years? On the screen, here is my submission. I've covered the public service. I've covered the growth mindset. They are enablers. I put them there because they're so important. So I'll just touch quickly on the others. Human capital. According to the Future of Jobs report from the World Economic Forum, the next few years, technology-related jobs will lead the way in jobs growth. So obviously, if we're looking at creating jobs in this economy, we have to look at technology and the cognitive skills that are required to grow the economy. Where will the opportunities come from? And not just technical skills, but the, what people call the soft skills, but what I call the smart skills. Active listening, empathy. I mean, whoever said that managing people is a soft skill? They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> managing people is one of the hardest things that you do. And the higher up you go in life, in the job, in the organization, the more you have to manage people. It's the hardest part of the job. That's the honest truth. 
So you're nothing soft about that skill. It's a smart skill, and it's an absolutely essential skill. And we have to train our young people to do that. And we have to train our workforce to do that. So very quickly, here are some of the skills that are required. The demand, information security. With all of this information, digital technologies, comes the need for cybersecurity. One of the biggest areas of need right now. Even our central bank, we have put out several times, is to get IT security specialists. And we are finding it's not so easy to recruit them. And even when they're available, they're being picked up by US and Canada and elsewhere because you know, we can't pay what they're being paid uh, in those countries. That's a serious challenge, but that's some of the areas. So young people, if you're listening and you're looking for opportunity, you want to find something where you could actually get a job, work from Grenada or work overseas and come back, hopefully you could work from Grenada because too many of us have gone overseas. Then here are some options for you. Let's move on. Renewables. At this moment, Grenada is only doing 4% of our electricity mix in renewables. 4%. We have some of the highest rates of electricity in the world at between 35 and 40 US cents per kilowatt hour. There is no way we could transform Grenada with paying that high cost of electricity. Think about what it is for our household. Think about what it is for government. Think about what it is for our foreign reserves. And by the way, if you think your electricity bill high, just understand where the climate is going. When I was growing up, AC was a luxury for rich people. Only rich people could afford AC. Nowadays, AC or you die. That's, that, that is now a natural part of adaptation. You have to build homes and build in AC, whether you use solar PV or whether it's... Because to make them livable, that's where we are. That's where we are. So all of you have seen your electricity bills. I have seen mine as well. The point I'm making is that transforming this country requires that we remove, we move quickly on renewables. Um, obviously, solar PV, geothermal, possibly tidal. Those are some of our options. So we got we to gotta get moving on that. Um, on financial literacy, I will simply say this. Only one in three Grenadians, one third, have insurance, have pension, and have stocks. One in three. That means two-thirds do not have. When we did the survey last year, 2022 now, on financial literacy, yeah, 2023, we found that only one in two persons are financially resilient in the currency union. So if I look around this room, I could make a fair conclusion that perhaps half of you, half of us, are not financially resilient. And what I also happen to know is a degree doesn't matter. There are people with degrees who have no idea how to manage money. Absolutely no idea. Let's move on. Our research team did some work a few years ago on how to grow these economies faster. And I will just point out for Grenada, they found that with these steps that you see on the side, lowering debt, improving the business climate, disaster cost reduction, human capital, and so on, less crime, we could actually grow the economy by 2.1% more. So remember where we are. We are 35 4%. We want to get to 7 This will help, along with some of the things I'm speaking about tonight. But if you look at the Grenada uh, for a moment, the areas that are most impactful for Grenada from this chart would be the green, the business climate, and the yellow, gold, the human capital development. Those two would make the most difference for Grenada based on the research that our team did. So what's the role of ECCTV? I'm almost done. Some of you may be saying, well, government has put out some ideas, they put some numbers on the table. How is ECCTV going to help with all of this? Well, let me tell you what we're doing, quickly. One, our first job is to maintain the strength of the EC dollar. I want to confirm tonight that our EC dollar remains strong. The current backing is 95% foreign reserves. The law requires us to be at 60, we're at 95. We weather the storm, we weather the COVID pandemic, 95 and rising. Second job for the bank is financial stability, keeping your deposits safe. That's why we have a team of examiners. As we speak, examiners wave. ECCB examiners. All ladies, by the way, all ladies. 
They're all from the central bank, and they are on mission in Grenada right now in a couple of our banks doing what they do. Every few weeks, they are in the field inside of banks examining, doing the job to make sure that deposits are kept safe. A job we take very, very seriously. We're doing that, and we have to continue to do that. Access to credit. We have launched the Partial Credit Guarantee Scheme, which is intended to make credit available to small businesses up to $750,000 with a guarantee of about 75 80% through your financial institution, your bank or your credit union or the development bank. Grenada, I think, has now done about $5 million, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not looking at the numbers as we speak. Uh, but we want to see more uptake on that. So Republic Bank and Co-op Bank in particular are the ones who have been pushing it of late, and we want to encourage all of our banks and credit unions to get involved. $30 million created there to create a guarantee fund to allow you to access. But the truth is that it is a guarantee. Excess liquidity exists in the banking system. So what we're trying to do is to leverage the liquidity that exists. Do you know that deposits are growing faster than loans in our banks? Yes, that's the truth. So we have what we call excess liquidity. We want to mop that up by giving good loans, and the way we want to help small business is through the partial credit guarantee. Again, there's information on that on our website if you're interested. Um, access to credit. I spoke about that. Support for SME. The next thing we're doing is a credit bureau. How many of you are familiar with a credit bureau? Credit score, credit registry. There's no way in a modern economy that you can operate without a credit bureau. If you go in any of the advanced economies, or even nearby, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, and so on, they have a credit bureau. We don't have one. This year, we are launching the credit bureau. Everywhere we have gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everywhere we have researched around the world, wherever a credit bureau has been established, credit has increased. And if you want to grow the economy, you have to grow credit. Businesses have to take risks. They have to be credit. Small businesses, householders, you have to have access to credit. So that's what that is about. Climate resilience. One of the things we're working on right now is that renewable energy infrastructure facility to help our governments and our countries to move faster on renewables. I don't know if you know this, but at ECCB, at our campus, we have gone green, meaning that we have solar PV plus storage, means that we are generating 100% of our electricity on campus. Good for the environment, good for the bottom line. We're saving over $1.4 million a year. Moral authority, when I go there to argue and advocate for a region and to embarrass the big remitters, to say, shame on you. If a small central bank from these small countries could do that, you got to do better. You need to do better. We are most at risk, and therefore we want to see change. Digital transformation, I will just show you this. One of the things that we're doing is to encourage youngsters to come to our campus uh, where we have interns, what we call bright sparks. On your screen are two Grenadians. So if you notice, you may know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are people you know. <laughs> Lyndon Jackassel, Janelle Brathwaite. We brought them up for six months. We extended for another six months. And they did so well, we kept them. <laughs> and that's a program we launched in 2017. We've, we've other countries as well in the current student have benefited. And uh, we're very proud of this program. We bring these youngsters out of college, IT, meaning... T. A. Marisha Community College, the state colleges, bring them to the campus, give them an experience, work experience, skills, and so on in IT, and then we encourage them to launch their careers and so on. So that is something practical that we have been working on with very good results. And then, I'm almost done. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, said this. And the reason why I like this quote is because he was struggling to keep the Union, the United States, together. Remember when the Civil War occurred? over slavery, and here's what he said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. Abraham Lincoln saved the Union, that is the United States. This was his speech to the Congress uh, 1872 or thereabouts, if I recall. Finally, a quote that I use whenever I do a talk. It's a bit of a mantra, a little anthem, if you will, now. 
As a region, we cannot change our history, nor can we change our geography. But together, we can elevate our development trajectory through innovation and collective action. Fellow Grenadian, it has been my absolute pleasure to deliver this lecture in honor of the distinguished Carol Bristol QC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you're clapping or you're taking the exercise, but I appreciate if you can. <laughs> Thank you kindly. Let's take a few questions. Moderator, we have a, yes. Let's take a few questions if you have any. I went over time, but um, I did ask for your patience to walk through some of these issues. Let's take some questions if you have any, please. Yes, Marion. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for that lecture. It was on point and perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of com comments. One of the things that we didn't address, we haven't been thinking about in terms of the per capita growth, mm -hmm. is that it is coupled, it is largely influenced by how we pay people in the, in the retail sector mm -hmm. and, and the civil service. So because of the imbalance in that and the private economy. Um, the other point I want to say, some of our, a lot of our population growth is from expats. Mm -hmm. As we migrate mm -hmm. outwards, there are people, I could see the growth, you know, I have been in Grenada since December 1996, mm -hmm. and I could see the growth inwards, and that has, in fact, our, the rate of our growth of 17% would have been even lower mm -hmm. if you didn't have that inward migration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a fact. Yeah. Um, so, so it's something that we need to look at. And I support your points on the public service, but, and especially the need for onward training and academic learning. Because as an attorney at law and having to interact with certain sections of the public service, they're not familiar with the change in the law. They're not familiar with the change in anything. And they always want to defy you and tell you what it's supposed to be. And even when you give them supporting information with respect to the law and the changes made, they don't believe that. But I don't know that, and I'll just pitch it aside. So the point for the, for the um, training. And I'll make one other point. The whole question of the mindset has to start in the home and in the school. It's not only in the general society, but the home and in the school. And, and people are not paying enough attention to that. And I am glad that you brought up the whole issue of faith for, and those who don't believe in God because when you think that there is nothing and it's only social media and they feel that is what drives their lives, you cannot have that level of growth that we aspire to. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Thank you. <laughs> While we wait for the next question, just to say on the first point, part of growing this economy, Dublin, is to get more and more people out of the informal economy and into the formal economy. And to help them understand, and we have to help them with that, to create incentives and opportunities for them. So small businesses to come out of the shade of the, the shadow economy down the ground and come into the light where you can get support in terms of incentives from government, training, 
an association where you can go to government together on policy areas and so on. That we have to organize better and get more and more people. In a lot of these countries, not just in Grenada, too many of our people are operating in the so-called informal economy. And, and also suffering because in that economy, they're not, they're not protections. Some of the protection they will get in the former, they're not getting there. So that's part of the challenge. And as we go along, we should map how we're moving the numbers from the informal into the formal because that is also where they have a seat at the table, as it were, and have a better chance of making a, a good livelihood. Anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Again, a very inspirational and important presentation tonight. I, I'm Grenadian, living in the UK, mm -hmm. and I'm so happy to be here tonight. There are two areas, really, about the Grenadian economy that I observe and i like your comment on, in terms of our attempt to get to, or, or aim to get to 7% growth. First, St. George's University, the importance of that to the economy of Grenada. <clears throat> and the other area that I observe that we're still struggling with, and that is the agricultural sector. Thank you. So you, you, you've led me to cover. By the way, when you get the, the lecture, there are a number of things I didn't touch tonight, believe it or not. One of which is part of the drivers that we need to see is the new hospital, teaching hospital that offers medical tourism. St. George University, education, principally St. George University, accounts for almost 25% of the Grenadian economy as we speak. In 1977, it was 2.3%. Today, it is 24.4% education. That's, that's how much this, this, this university means to them. By the way, did you guys know that one in 25 doctors in the New York, New Jersey area were trained in Grenada, exported by Grenada from St. George University? That's an amazing fact. We export doctors, nurses too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know that's a challenge for our health system. But the point here is that that teaching hospital, which the government is moving forward with again, I strongly endorse. Because for me, part of the big push, the next step in our evolution, economic diversification, which I didn't get to, it's in my notes, but I didn't get to it, is in fact that teaching hospital with medical tourism, which allows us to then also make another diversification. Because when people talk about Diversification in Grenada. Sometimes I hear this thing about diversifying away from tourism. I don't subscribe to that. We must just diversify around tourism. That's what medical tourism does. It leverages the tourism product, it leverages St. George University, and it puts it together. Tourism accounts for about 40% of the Grenadian economy. SU for about 25, that's 65% of the economy. So what you want to do now, bring another major initiative to leverage those two things that will propel the economy. If you're starting to talk about Dublin, you have to go big with some bold ideas. That is one such idea. I didn't talk about the blue economy. By the way, if you look on page 64, I think, of the national plan, you will find the blue economy is in there. I didn't speak about that. It's in a little bit of my notes. But the point is, that is a very important area. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Going forward, that is part of how we're going to grow the economy. Double the economy. That's 7% growth that we're talking about over the next 10 years. And agriculture, agriculture um, again, it's in my notes, food and nutrition security. And the point I'm making is that we need to fully go hard with the 25 by 25. Reduce the food input bill by 25% by 2025. I don't think we're on track at this point the last time I checked. And we need to move with some alacrity. And I will say this, if we're going to CUSD bring that food input bill down, we have to tackle three food categories. Meat, cereals, and fruits and vegetables. Why? Because they account for 50% of the food basket. I don't know if that means some of us have to go vegan. <coughs> but we're going to have to tackle that issue. Good for households, good for the public finances, good for foreign reserves, most importantly, good for our health. Going back to that issue we saw of the chronics where four in five deaths in Grenada are attributable to the chronic diseases. So agriculture now is about 2.5% of GDP. In 1977, it was around, I think, 12 14%. It has dropped significantly. 
at this moment, the focus should be on food and nutrition security. I was in Miami two, two, two weeks ago having a meal. And on the menu was some shots, S-H-O-T-S, shots. One of which was called a wellness shot. What was that? A brew of lemon, ginger, and turmeric, exactly. Five dollars. But I was longing for home, and I bought it. <laughs> it's expensive. But then I asked myself, shouldn't this shot be in every hotel in Grenada? If not, why not? This is health. We, we, well, there you go. All of these things are available in Grenada, in abundance. Shouldn't we be doing this? A simple example of how we can leverage our agriculture in our export industry, which is tourism. So I absolutely agree with you, but the focus has to be on food. And by the way, let me just give a shout out to women entrepreneurs in food and agribusiness in Grenada. I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of people like the Governor General, Dr. Dame Cecilia Grenade, Dr. Val Majestime, Ms. Shadal Naya Compton, Ms. Teresa Marisho. All of these are leading women in agribusiness in Grenada who have done very, very well for, you know, and we need to show them some love and support what they're doing and scale up what they're doing. I shout out the women in agribusiness. Next question. Ralph, and then the young lady. <laughs> Good evening, Ralph Ashtialik. Going straight for the heart here. Mm -hmm. Are we playing Russian roulette with our energy security? I remember in, I, I was a little boy in 73, I remember being in my dad's car in a line for almost the whole day to get gas in Babo. Um, right, right when the Ukraine war started, Germany, sneakily behind the, the EU, went and bought up a whole set of gas reserves all over the world, including Trinidad, some from Trinidad and Venezuela. And I just thought, wow, what if Let's say Russia, Ukraine really goes wrong, or the Middle East goes wrong, or Venezuela, Guyana goes wrong. Gas, imagine uh, our energy prices go up threefold, fourfold, tenfold, which can easily happen. And where are we? 4% renewables. I'll leave that right there. So, Ralph, thank you. Because, again, when you read my notes, you will see. How do we speak about independence and be so dependent on the rest of the world for food and energy? Grenada coming of age requires to take our food and nutrition security seriously and our energy security seriously. And that is part of how we do that. Right now, come. No, 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 understood. No, 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 I, I mean, of course. Let, let, let me say it here for the, um, the, the digital audience. I actually wanted to put it to ECCB, because this is not Grenada alone. Um, Barbados is close to about 40%. The rest of the islands, we vary somewhere between us, 4%, and maybe 20%. And we, we're pushing renewables, but we're kind of, you know, nudging it on the side. We have sun in excess, we have wind, we have geothermal. Uh, wave, as you say, and governments are talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And, and we're this close, you're seeing it all over the world, we're this close to something global. Now, if we had, imagine if we had 100% uh, uh, or close to 100% renewable energy. Look, the, the COVID that just went there, um, where we were, I don't know, we could have been 50% un or underemployed. Can you imagine if we owned 100% of Grenlec, we, we the nation, can you imagine if we were, like I said, somewhere between 50 and 100% renewable, you would have had enough people who had a secondary income source. We would have had a small economy within the economy, not paying foreign exchange for, for gas, not relying on gas. I mean, yeah, yeah, you tick so many boxes there. So I come back to the point. 
shouldn't this be one of the major points that ECCB is pushing at each of our eight islands and maybe broader CARICOM that we need to absolutely accelerate our renewable energy um, to, to, to make sure that we are bulletproof and not playing that um, Russian roulette with um, energy security. Sorry for being slow. Absolutely. So Ralph, in the currency union is 10%. In terms of renewables in the currency union, 10%. Grenada is four. Dominica and St. Vincent and Grenada, because of hydro, is a bit higher. But so they bring up the average. So that's how we get to 10%. Number of countries are at four, five, six percent. So it's not just Grenada. You're absolutely right. Uh, obviously, I'm focused on Grenada tonight, so I've, I've tried to be Grenada specific. What we're doing at ECCB is the ECCU Renewable Energy Infrastructure Facility. And the idea is to do two things. One, to address the policy and regulatory gaps. We, did it, we started this work two years ago. And the first thing we found, why is renewables not moving faster? One, policy and regulatory gaps. So for example, in some countries, even though we say we are encouraging renewables, we still do not have feed-in tariffs properly articulated. Nobody's going to invest in the private sector or go to a financial institution and borrow if they have no clarity about the, the, payback, the payback period. You got to know. And the only way you would know that is with a feed-in tariff. So we said to governments, you have to put in a feed-in tariff if you want to send a clear message to the private sector. Secondly, we found in some cases we're promoting solar PV, but we're not giving incentive for battery storage. Again, it has to be an integrated solution. You have to provide for battery storage. We're encouraging our fishermen. Well, we have to support them not with two-stroke two engines, but four-stroke engines. In other words, we, get, we got granular on this. Then the, first, second, the next thing we realize is grid instability. Some utilities are still saying they are concerned about grid instability, how much they could take from these intermittent sources. When I was PS Finance and Energy, that was a conversation, and at the time they said they probably couldn't take more than 10%. I am reliably advised that the technology has moved on. These grids can take at least 25% renewables, some even more. And so, but we have to, we have to get them into, into that um, mode in terms of um, participation. Third, small size. When you go to the international capital markets, they say in these countries with these investments, they're too small. To interest these big financiers, we have to come big. So the idea is we have to, we have to pull, bundle these things together. And then, just lack of knowledge technical capacity, both within the government and the private sector. So the first phase was the diagnostic assessment of the barriers. The second phase now is designing the funding strategy. So far, we've raised through the World Bank principally and some grant, 100 million US dollars. And so the plan is to build that up, and we've engaged in partners. I've been talking to various people um, over the last you know, several weeks around that to be able to allow our governments to access that and to help us to build out our renewable energy potential, to really go after it in a hard and, and sustainable way. But there have been some barriers. If you go to Dominica, they will tell you the challenges with geothermal, other countries as well. But you're absolutely right. Energy security is key. Think about the pandemic. If the ships had stopped coming, and for a while we weren't sure whether they're coming out of Miami to bring food, some of us would have had a problem. And no energy, where are we? Where are we? We are paying now four times what the mainland U.S. is paying for the price of electricity. If we get renewables in and we do it in a proper way, we should at least cut that by half. At least half. Jamaica is doing 10, 10, 10 U.S. cents thereabouts. At least half. If you get it down to 20, 20 U.S. cents, that's a big, big, big improvement. That goes to the bottom line for households, the government finances, the foreign reserves. All right, I said too much. Do we have any more questions? We have a student. Very, very good. Hi, good night. Um, I'm Sumita Upadhyaya. I am a psychology student at SGU. So as mentioned by this, young, this lady, um, she mentioned that it's important that the change in mindset starts at the home or school. Mm -hmm. However, I've seen instances where parents might induce a negative impact, a, ne a negative impact of the government or implicating rules, so what strategies would you re recommend for that? Let me understand the question. You've seen difficulties where the parents... Are, are giving a, perspective, a negative perspective of, of um, abiding by the rules or instances of yes. the government. Well, the challenge we have is that we have parents who can't parent. 
Um, we have children parenting, which is a hopeless situation. I mean, you have seen the social pathologies manifest. So we have to have parenting programs. And even some of us who are parents know it's not an easy job. We try our very best. Um, but we have to have, you have to be trained. This, this idea of you born with this and born with that, that's nonsense. You got to be trained, right? Trained parents. Um, reorient minds. So for the parents who are reorienting parents are children against the government or against society, we have to help rescue these people. But the truth is that it's the children you have to rescue. Because if you're taking a strategic approach, some of these, as we would say, they harden back. They're probably a little late. But at least if you tackle the children and you get the right mindset, you see zero to five? Zero to five? Crucial. Some of our best teachers should be doing that early childhood program. Zero to five. Because the sign shows by the time they reach 9, 10, 11, in some cases, it's already too late. You look at some of the criminal deviants that you see now, and you look to see. We lost them right in that window. And it's almost now impossible to pull them back. So I think we have to have interventions to deal with that. Church, state, community, families, extended families, whole of society approach. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Good luck. All the best with your studies. Anyone else? You exhausted? Touch your neighbor. Touch your neighbor. Give them an encouragement. Up. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Um, good evening to everyone. I want to, I know you spoke about agriculture, I want to, and you talk about, you spoke about that shot that you had, that $5 shot. Yes. And I'm passionate about the sea. My grandfather was a fisherman, mm -hmm. as well as a farmer. And um, I'm, a, I'm passionate about sea moss. Mm. And you look out there and you see St. Lucia and all these different countries doing things big with sea moss. Mm -hmm. And I sat in on a few sessions that we had here in Grenada about CMOS and doing it big and all of that. And in order for us to do CMOS big in Grenada, we have all these different small farmers, fishermen all over, mm -hmm. but we're not able to dry the CMOS in a large scale to export. So I'm being bold here. We need a nice big factory where we can gather all our sea moss from St. David's to Karaku, uh, a, a, a drying facility where we can pull the sea moss. Then they dry in mm -hmm. that drying facility. Mm -hmm. But then adjacent to that, we have somewhere where we can then manufacture sea moss pill, sea moss gel, the sea moss mask, and then we could export our sea moss. So I'm standing here representing I did, the CMOS farmers. They didn't ask me, but the, we, we need something from the ECCB. If you can promise us for the 50th, I, I'm sure we could ask the Honorable Prime Minister to give us an area. And um, from St. David's to Karaku, we go around and we'll get everybody to come together because we sit every time and we always talk about it right i grew up on sea moss um i had pickled sea moss on the weekend in a salad and i was like we're sending all of these things out there it's happening there and we we're not so it's it's a question but it's something for you to think about and it's also for the prime minister to think about it. but um i want to see us move sea moss from just the dry sea moss to where we may do the sea moss pill the gel, the mass, but we're not able to do it because the small farmers, and some of them just the $40, uh, we can't get there. But if we get that facility and then we form a cooperative now and we come and we pull our, our wet sea moss in and we, we're going to create employment, we're going to... Where, so. where are you? Sorry. Thank you. Excellent. Give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> Love that. Where are you based? Where's your operation based? Well, I'm um, from the village of Kelly's, mm -hmm. but we see Moss family in True Blue. In True, right. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Miss Seamoss Grenada. <laughs> so, 
You know what I love about what you said? Several things. You illustrated an application of the blue economy. See, the blue economy is tourism. It's energy. It's food. Marine. You're supposed to have a sea moss. It's carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. It's a range of marine transport, a range of things. Again, I didn't cover them, but they're all in there. That's a good application. The Minister for Tourism, <laughs> who hears from the parish of St. David, heard you, uh -huh. and he will take your message to the cabinet. <laughs> and then they will approach you. <laughs> right? Thank you so very much. This is, this is very good. You know, as you spoke, I, I just want to share this. An agri professional, a female in St. Lucia, her name is Keetling Karu Afrira, said this. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. Teach a woman to farm, and you feed a nation for eternity. Appreciate the work you're doing. Again, look at these women leaders. Oh man, good, it's so good to see. So minister, we have to help. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. I love CMOS, by the way. So you're speaking to the converted. Anyone else? Yes, please. Good evening, everybody. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I know we mentioned the evolving labor market and the top 10 growth areas like sustainability specialists and robotics engineers and stuff. How are we going to grow these areas if we don't have programs here to train people? Because what happens when you migrate to study or you go away to study, chances are you get opportunities there one time. So persons tend to stay. So are we going to be investing in programs to develop these areas? Or yeah. So, so here's the thing. Thanks for the question. Part of doubling this economy is a strategy that addresses Grenadians in the diaspora and the Grenadians who are going training and coming back. A lot of the people now with the digital economy have the potential to work from home. So we have to leverage that to get more Grenadians to come back and to live, invest, and work from home. The challenge for some of them, many of them, is health care. It is health care. They either can't come because they, they, they need to have relative quick access to health services, or those of them, there are few who come, and then every three months they have to run back up for the health stuff. So part of this whole economic diversification around this medical tourism, around this teaching hospital, is to create a health service in the country where more of our people feel comfortable, Grenadians as well as visitors, investors who want to come and live here, to come, live, work, invest with the knowledge that they have basic good health care. And then if you need something advanced, then you have time to go abroad and get it. Because I will tell you, for all the remittances that come back, and we appreciate the remittances. They do not compensate for the critical loss of skills that we have suffered from brain drain. So if you ask me, part of the reason why we're not further along is because too many of our best people are overseas. Not just doctors and nurses, our scientists, some of our sustainability specialists, some of our businesses, business guys, MBAs, and so on. So, Part of the strategy has to be creating that environment at home with respect to the digital economy, along with the health system. If you combine those well, more people will come back and live here. Because some of them are tired of the winters. Some of them are tired of the crime. Some of them are tired of various things. They want to come home, but they, they need to have that to, to give them some comfort to come home. So I think that's part of what we do. But again, I want to encourage with this telecommuting now, this whole change in the world of work, more Grenadians can work from Grenada if they choose to, still earn their US dollars or their pounds sterling or their euros, and spend more of their time. And even not the whole year, three months, six months. But that will make a big difference to the economy if they're spending here, they're living here, and at least spending more of their time in their homeland. So I think that is how we want to do it. 
And I do want to say to young people, come home. I know it's not easy. I came home. And by the way, I'm still home. The Central Bank is Central Bank. I happen to be based in St. Kitts, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm home. I know people who didn't feel they had the opportunity and stayed out and all power to them. But I admire those of us who came home and served and continue to serve. And I'm hoping more and more of us will see the need. Thousands of Grenadians came back for the Golden Jubilee. I saw some classmates from New York I hadn't seen in 35 years. And they're excited about doing stuff. We need to harness that. We need to leverage that right now and get them to at least spend more of the time. I appreciate the initiative of government to get some of them to serve on boards, even from overseas. I think that's a start. You're building the connection. You're building that connection. You're building that relationship to a point where hopefully more, more of them will want to come home. So I think those are the things we need to work on. The digital economy and the healthcare with a nice package. And a lot of them, and I'll end here, they want structure. So they want to give back, but they need to, how am I going to give back? They, they want, and they don't want hustle and all of this run around. I have one week in Grenada where I want to do. Somebody has to organize this, and I show up, deliver my service, and take the plane out and go back to whatever. I can't be coming around here looking for chairs, looking for a desk, looking for the manager for the key for the building. You know, I, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. So a lot of it is just structure. I know we have an office of diaspora affairs. Those are some of the things that they will need to be working on to get more Grenadians to contribute. The training for those persons. There, there, I, I, to my mind, there are more and more opportunities now for training, both in the country and online. I mean, training, the opportunities have never been easier and cheaper in some cases. So it depends on what you're doing. But I mean, you have basic things, Coursera, you have a number of online platforms for free to get a start. And then, of course, you may want to do advanced studies where you need. You need. But I believe more and more opportunities are being created. More and more scholarships are being created. And I would, I would urge you to avail yourself of those um, in the area of sustainability, for example, or whatever your passion is. But the key is you must, let me tell you something. One year after I left NCB, now Republic, and went to the Ministry of Finance. In fact, six months after, I got an offer to come back to NCB in those days, now Republic, doubling my salary. The public servant in the Ministry of Finance, working for $1,600, $1,700 a month at the time. And I made the decision to stay in the government service. And I tell young people all the time, money is not all. It's, it's, not, it's important. I don't, want to I don't want to diminish, but it is not all. I look back 31 years later, and I have absolutely no regret about that decision to serve my country then as I'm doing now. There have been opportunities in the private sector. I've stayed in government and the public sector. I tease my friends sometimes. I say, you took the vow of poverty, prosperity, I took the vow of poverty. But that's OK. Service is important. I came from a family of public servants, and it's, it means a lot to me. So I want to challenge you on that as well. So to serve. You want to be great? Serve. Serve your country. It's not all about dollars and cents. I think they want me to get off the stage. We have one more. So that will be the last one I'm told. Good night, everyone. Happy to be the last. I must say I thoroughly enjoyed uh, your presentation. And you have identified one of the theaters of transformation as digital transformation. Now, one challenge for small island development states is ensuring equitable access to technology across the population, especially in, in remote areas. Now, how will Grenada address the digital divide and ensure everyone benefits from this digital transformation that you have identified? Very good question. So the way I think about it is that, and we saw the divide exposed in the pandemic between the connected and the unconnected. We can't afford to have digital exclusion. We need to see digital connectivity 
broadband connectivity as a public good, a global public good. And therefore, it has to be accessible, it has to be affordable, it has to be reliable. So I know governments and private sector are working together to provide that, whether it's hotspots in some cases, whether it's packages for schools. But to, to harness the digital economy, which is now at least 15% of the global economy and growing, and split it to get to about 25% of the global economy in the next three, four years, we have to make broadband connectivity more available. The last time I checked in Grenada, it was about 60, 70%, I believe, in penetration. Mobile is higher, but broadband connectivity was about 60, whereas mo mobile is 105, thereabouts. So public sector and private sector, partnership to make it a public good. When you make it a public good, it's not simply about making money. It is about subsidizing it to build a digital economy or build a new economy on which digital transformation is a critical part. So that is what I would suggest. And that's why, for example, at ECCB, we've been working on the training and so on on that side of it. But you have to have connectivity. I am, we still sometimes assume when we do these payment systems and we do the cash and we do these things that people have internet. And then you find in some communities, they don't. Or you send people to do homework and you go to children who do not have internet at home. That is still a reality in our countries. That has to be resolved because if we don't bring them in, we are basically leaving them behind. And then they're going to show up in our faces, manifesting in social pathologies, crime, deviant behavior, hopelessness, which will hurt us all. So that's what I would suggest. Frame it as a global public good, make it accessible to all. Thank you so much. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. God bless you all. <clears throat> Governor, on behalf of UWI, we would like to give you this little gift to show our appreciation. And I was very careful in the bag that I chose. It says... For I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Well done. Well chosen. Thank you very much, Doctor. Very, very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. God bless. One people, one journey, one future, one love. God bless you all. Thank you so very much, Governor. Did you enjoy the lecture? Yes. Okay. So let us give him a lusty round of applause. So just two things. Um, to participate in the raffle, we have a table set up on the side while the cocktail is going on. You can go over to the table and meet Ms. Shimana james Ila here. <laughs> And also, there's a, a, a light cocktail, which is set up at the back. We would like you to stay around and mingle and have further discussions. I now call on Ms. Janae Greenwich, one of our students, to move the vote of thanks. With protocol already established, pleasant night to everyone. Education is the key to unlocking a world, a passport for freedom, Oprah Rimfrey famously said. I am Janae Greenwich and a proud and current UWI Global Campus student. Pleasant good night. Embracing the spirit of unlocking endless possibilities we convey for the ninth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Our heartfelt gratitude begins with Father Rumerick, whose prayer beautifully set the stage for today's event, infusing it with thoughtfulness and unity. 
Thank you, Father. We appreciate all of our ministers and government officials present today. We thank you for your unwavering commitment to our nation's development in your vital roots. Your presence here speaks volume for the dedication to our country's progress. Let's give a warm round of applause to Trio for stirring rendition of our national anthem and the 50th team song up from here. You did fill our hearts with pride and unity. Now, turning to the highlight of today's event, Governor Timothy Antoine of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Governor Antoine, your presentation of Grenada's coming of age, our big push for transformation was enlightening and a source of great inspiration. Your vision for our nation's future characterized by growth and opportunity resonated with all of us. Your inspiration, your insights on collectively inspiring towards a resilient and thriving Grenada were genuinely impactful. As we go up, up, up. We are immensely thankful for your wisdom and forward thinking approach. Thank you. We also thank Mr. Wilvon Granger, Chief Experience Officer of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited for your continued support, sponsorship, and role in fostering the growth of our nation's ed economy and education sector. Thank you, sir. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Francis Severin, Principal of the University of the West Indies Global Campus and Dr. Cher Cheryl Soli, Director of the UWI Global Campus Sites. Your contributions and support in the field of education are invaluable and greatly appreciated. Your presence here today signifies the strength and strong bond between academia and the reach of the global campus. Thank you, they are online. <laughs> we are grateful to Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, Deputy Director Acting of the UWI Global Campus Sites for your warm welcome and the introduction of our esteemed speaker. Your efforts have been crucial in the success of this event. A special acknowledgement to Ambassador Gillian Bristol, the daughter of Mr. Carol Bristol QC, and the other family members who are present or joining online to continue the legacy of Mr. Carol Bristol QC. Your presence is a tribute to his lasting impact and the values he championed. Thank you, Mrs. Keisha Kamajan Branch, for aptly chairing this year's lecture series. Your organizational skills and dedication have been instrumental in the seamless execution of this event. Thank you. Finally, to the members of the UWI Global Campus and TAMCC community, St. George's University, educators, students, media representatives, 2023 to 2024 Grenada Gill Chapter Executive of the University of the West Indies Global Campus and well wishers, viewers online, your participation today celebrates our collective dedication to education, development, and the bright future for Grenada as we go. In closing, let us remember that each step forward in education is a step towards a brighter, more enlightened Grenada. Today, we, we have taken a significant stride in that direction. You all have been a great audience. Thank you for all Thank you all for being part of this incredible journey as we bring Grenada. Thank you very much.